Well, what, a, what a week this has been. We've, uh, last Sunday, when we were leaving, uh, it was, I don't know, five-ish or something like that, I guess, in, in the afternoon, and Noah and I were out there uh, talking to some of the people over across the way there in the park, and uh, got an emergency alert on our phones that uh, something was going on. And, you know, you, a lot of times it's a child or something like that, but uh, this time it was about wildfires in, in Tantallon. And as we drove on down the road, then we saw the plumes of smoke that were filling the sky. Over the week, there are 16,000 people that were evac- evacuated with threats that more would have to be evacuated. Some of you were threatened with that. And some friends and relatives had, uh, that, that we know were evacuated and more directly involved. We began to hear through the week of even new fires that were breaking out. We heard that some of them were even likely set deliberately. And there were different things that were uh, coming out. And, it, and you could see at one point how this could be really, really bad when there were new fires around Thursday that were breaking out over here, over here, over here. How could it possibly be stopped? And you see in these things, it, it, it shows us how frail we are. And, you know, we wouldn't, really wouldn't have any ability to stop it if it just went all over the place. We, there's nothing we would be able to do. And that's our position. We're, we're before God. We're dependent upon Him, whether we want to acknowledge that or not. By the end of the week, 151 people had lost their homes. You might say, well, where is God in such times? You're talking about God. Where is God? Does He see what's going on? And why doesn't He do something? Does He even care? Now today I'm going to break from our regular sermon series in Hebrews, since we've had these events this week, to look at those questions. If you really want to know the answer to those questions, then the answer is, is given to us in the Scripture. It's very, very plain. And we could answer it in, uh, from a number of different places in Scripture. But I've chosen Matthew 23 to look at today. We've answered such questions before um, in the past. And I uh, want to look at it from this perspective today. Here we have our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, looking on Jerusalem, which is going to have the worst destruction that they had ever had, even worse than the exile, coming up soon, and even in his generation. Now, he's, of course, going to, he's, he's going away, he's going to be crucified, and he's, he's going to ascend to the Father. But if he had lived to be, you know, a full life of 70 years old, then he would have been in the time when these things were going on. In, in Jesus, we're going to be able, though, to see what God Almighty is like as a human. That's what we see with with Jesus. That's what Jesus is. He is the true, eternal God who took humanity, who took a human human flesh, who became a a true human body. He took a true human body with a true human spirit. He continued to be the eternal Son of God. Because you can't not be, God doesn't change. You can't be God and then not be God anymore. He, he's completely the same as the eternal God. He was upholding the whole universe when he was also in human flesh nursing at his mother's breast, dependent upon her milk, or he would die. Um, you know, it, he, was, he came in true human flesh. He had two natures. He continued then to be the eternal son of God who called the world into being, but he also became... Some, in a very interesting way, what he himself created. He created human beings, and he became one of those in uh, taking on human flesh. So with him, we get to see what God is like as his perfect image. We were made in God's image, but we're fallen and we're corrupted and twisted. Jesus, you get to see just what the image of God is supposed to look like in human flesh. You see him with human limitations, with human emotions, 
and all of these things, you see him as a worshiper of God who is dependent on God and relies on God because he's one of us. He had the spirit of God. He became one person with two entirely distinct natures. Sort of like what you would be if you became a dog and yet continued to be human at the same time. What would you do? You would, you would go and ask yourself for food. <laughs> and you wouldn't be able to get the food out because you're a dog and you'd have to get the, your, the, the person to do that for you. And uh, you would beg to go outside when you needed to go out. Uh, yes, Jesus did miracles and things, but the Bible actually tells us that he was so fully in the human nature that he did those miracles by the Holy Spirit. That uh, he, that's, that's how he, he did them. He had authority to call things into being because he was the son of God. That was who he is, who the person. But in terms of his human nature, he was like us. So again, when we see Jesus and when we deal with him, what are we looking at? We're looking at God in human form. And we get to learn about God by seeing the perfect image of God in one of us, something that we can grasp. We see a man who acts the way God would act if he were a human being. Because that's just what he is. God in human flesh. We see a man who is holy and without lies, without any sin, without any corruption. A man who is full of love for God, full of love for his neighbor. We see a man who cares deeply for others, and not just cares, but also acts for others, sacrifices himself for others. We see a man who, because of his godliness, establishes a righteous kingdom. There was no righteous kingdom on the earth because there were no righteous people. So he establishes, he's the foundation of a righteous kingdom in the earth. He establishes that, and he calls people to come into that kingdom and provides for them to be able to come into that kingdom. We see a man who provides salvation for this kingdom that brings fallen human beings back to God. We see a man who is even willing to take responsibility for the people's sins that he calls into his kingdom so that he bears their transgressions. He has already done that and been accepted. He bears the punishment of them himself so that they can be pardoned and can enter his kingdom and live there, and he provides them with the Holy Spirit, the fullness of the Spirit that he has. He gives us the Holy Spirit to transform us. Now, what is the attitude of this man who is God as man when he sees things like destructive fires coming upon his people? Something like we've seen this week. In Matthew 23, he foresees as a prophet the coming destruction of his own people. As a man, he was born to a people, to the nation of Israel, the people to whom God promised to bring this son, to bring salvation, the son of promise that would come to be the savior of the world. He was to be born of them and born for them, and then he was to bless them and the nations of the earth with the salvation. He sees his people that in 70 AD, in his very generation, destruction is coming upon them. He sees that the great city of Jerusalem, where the temple was built, that displayed God's way of salvation for all of those years, about uh, 1,500 years, that that city was going to be destroyed by the invading Roman armies. It would be the worst judgment that they had ever seen, and it would be for rejecting him the Son of God who became man, that he might redeem them. What was his attitude as he looks on the calamity where these would be destroyed, where there'd be so much destruction? What does he say as he considers the great city and its destruction as he walks upon, as he comes upon it looking at, looking at the city? Listen, I'll read to you what he said. It's recorded in God's holy word. It's printed on your outline as well if you have that one of the outlines. It's in Matthew 23, beginning in verse 37. This is what he says, looking on that city. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you, 
you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And there we end the reading of God's word. Thank the Lord for giving us his precious word that shows us the thoughts of this one who is God in flesh. What do we see about our Savior here when he looks upon his people under affliction? We see that he is a tender-hearted Savior who is burdened for his people. The words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, express deep passion. You know something of that. When someone goes wrong, there's a tendency to repeat their name like that, to say, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. What are you doing? Why? Why are you doing what you're doing? In 2 Samuel 18, we see that King David responded that way when his son Absalom was foolish and, 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 and stupid and went away from the Lord. He, it says in 2 Samuel 18, then the king, King David, was deeply moved and went up to the chamber over the gate and wept. And as he went, he said thus, Oh, my son Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, if only I had died in your place. Oh, Absalom, my son. He repeats his name. And no doubt, some of you parents have had occasion to say that with your children. Like you repeat, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? child that has brought sorrow, lamentation. Sometimes you address them in that way, you speak to them that way. And sometimes you just groan in your spirit, repeating their name. We see Jesus doing this when he sees his beloved disciple Peter, filled with pride, saying, Lord, everybody else might deny you, but I won't. And Jesus said, Simon, Simon. You're being stupid. Like You're not going to stand in your own strength. Who do you think you are? Right? Simon, Simon. He says, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. You're going to get chopped up so that you can see what you are. The, 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 the sin in you and the, it's going to be separated to, to show you what you are so that you can be divided from that, that pride that you have now. There's a, there's a groaning as he sees his disciple not listening. Now perhaps, perhaps some of you can identify with being the Simon or the Jerusalem. Maybe you've been that to your own parents. Or maybe you still are that to your own parents. One that they would repeat your name in this way. Crying out like this is a way of saying, why would you do this? It's a lamentation of senseless ruin of a person's life. You see them senselessly opposing, resisting to their own destruction, to their own harm. It's like, stop it already. Why are you going this way? You, there's, a way of, there's a way of blessing and peace and happiness. Why do you resist what is given to you from the Lord? Jesus had come to his people to save them. There should have been celebration and rejoicing. The Messiah has come. He had told them that he was there to establish God's kingdom. The good news, the kingdom is at hand. Repent and, and be saved. Come and enter into the kingdom. He had called them that they might live. He had done signs among them. See, I'm the one who comes with eternal life. I bring healing I cleanse lepers. I raise the dead. I'm here to forgive sins. I'm, I'm able to forgive sins. I feed the hungry. He had issued the promise of full forgiveness and strength to live for God. He said, just come. Come to me and be saved. But hard hearts refuse to believe. Jerusalem, Jerusalem. What, why? It's, it's free grace. It's not something you have to do something that you can't do. Come to me, he said, and you will find rest for your souls. Why refuse? Why? Jerusalem, Jerusalem. He said the same thing of other cities, didn't he? Oh, Capernaum, Capernaum. He talked to other places in a similar manner. This same lamentation that Jesus had for Jerusalem, he has for his people today. 
He has not changed. When I came to Halifax to start this church some 25, 26 years ago, I learned that over 86% of the people in our province, in Nova Scotia, were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That was really quite a statistic. I looked back a little bit before that, and I saw where it was like 10 years before, and it was in the 90s. Before that, it was over 95%. You go back. That's right, the great majority had the Savior's name upon them as the one who cleanses from sin. That's what baptism signifies. Yet, like Israel, it was obvious that they were not looking to Him for cleansing. They had the sign, but they didn't have the thing signified. Oh, Halifax, Halifax, if only you had known the things that would make for your peace. It's right here at your door, the sign on your body. And you refuse to receive Halifax, Halifax. What are you doing? Today, there are fewer who are baptized. But it's still the majority of, our, of the residents in, in our province. Yet we're told that less than 10% of these go to church. We certainly do not see our city and our province follow, following him and going to him as a gracious priest that he is, our great high priest. There's no one like him who is seated at the right hand of the majesty on high, whoever lives to make intercession for his people, who has a sacrifice that he has already offered that's been accepted, who is able and ready to help us. We don't see people going to him, do we? even though they have that mark of his baptism. That's what Jesus saw. That's what he saw at Jerusalem. They just weren't coming. But we can be certain that as Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, when he saw the terrible things that would befall them for rejecting his salvation, he says the same thing to us here. Halifax, Halifax. He is burdened for us and for the destruction that we are bringing upon ourselves by rejecting His salvation. He is the Savior who is passionate for His people. That's what we see with these words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Now moving on, see how He is a Savior who relentlessly pleads with us in the face of affliction. Just look at all the ways that He has pled with us to come back to Him. Of course, we fell very, very early in the world when Adam and Eve, first parents, the human race, rebelled against God. Before the Son of God became the man Jesus, the Son of God, of course, was still there, and always there. He, he sent prophets to call us to come to Him that we might be saved. The world is very obviously cut off from God and needs to be reconciled. We like to pretend, don't we? We like to pretend that we're really good people, that inside, you know, we're really we're pretty good people. We have, we have good intentions. And uh, when, in fact, we're all sinners who have opposed our Maker, our glorious Maker, all of us, all of us have said, not your way, but my way. What did the perfect man say? Not my way, but your way. What do we say? Not your way, but my way. As soon as it crosses us, then we're ready to go off on our... No, I'm not, I don't like what God said. He's not God. That's a horrendous thing for the one that made us. He is worthy. Not what you want, God. What I want. I'm not going to bear something for you. Why would I do that? Not your will, but my will. We think this is normal. And it is ordinary, isn't it? It's what we all do. But it's high rebellion against God. And we don't get it. That's the root of it. You don't have to be out doing some great sin that everyone goes, oh. it's just that attitude that's right there. Like, not your way, my way. I don't like, I'm not going to do, we, again, he, he created us to be beautiful image bearers of him who love mercy and who do justice. People who know God and who worship the true God and who humbly serve him and live in obedience 
to him. People who truly love him and truly love each other with a sincere and deep love. How far we are from that. You know how far you are from that. You know. It, we're, we're far from that. The Lord has graciously called us to come to be restored. Look to me and be saved, he said, all you ends of the earth. He sent prophets to declare his gracious message to us. He came himself first when uh, God appeared to Adam and Eve. And then he raised up prophets over the years to bring his gracious message to plead with us in his name. These prophets show us our need. They show us how we've gone wrong, what we don't want to admit. And then they show us that God has promised to save us if we will humble ourselves and come to him for salvation. For 2,000 years before Jesus came, he singled out a nation, the people that came from Abraham, Abraham and his seed. That he called out, from, they became known as Israel from which he raised up prophets, especially to proclaim his promised salvation in the world. He so worked in these people that, in these prophets, the prophets in particular, that they faithfully spoke his word, pleading with their fellow citizens to come to the Lord and to continue with him. He promised that it would be from, from them and for them that the son of promise would come. They were the ones that were to bring the savior of the world into the world. Okay, the, these were the people. They had these prophets and everything. And uh, God saw to it that some of them believed. Okay? He, he, there's always a remnant, according to election, that he preserved, even when they went the worst way, that, that heard the promise and that looked to God for salvation and received the blessing. But as a whole, they rejected God. You can see that this is the heart, at the heart of Jesus' lamentation that we read in in uh, Matthew 23. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. What else does he say? The one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. That was his message. They were his prophets that were bringing his plea. It, but that did, that did not stop him from pleading. He might have given up. Though Israel rejected the prophets, the Son of God still came as promised. And when he came, he himself began to plead with them. He said things like, when he was here, Come to me, and you will find rest for your souls. We read that this morning. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Whoever believes in me will not perish, he said, but have everlasting life. But even as he spoke the words, they were looking for opportunities to destroy him. That's how they responded. Jesus knew this. And still he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. Still he continued to plead with them. And in the verses just before this passage that we read, this, the verses just before in Matthew 23, verse 34, he declares that he is going to send more people to plead with them after he goes away. So even after they rejected him and crucified him, he says he's still going to send more people and they're going to treat them the same way. Look what he says, verse 34, 23, 34. Therefore, indeed, I send you prophets, wise men, and scribes. Some of them you will kill and crucify. Some of them you will scourge in your synagogues and persecute from city to city that on you may come all the righteous blood shed on the earth from the blood of righteous Abel to the blood of Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, whom you murdered between the temple and the altar. Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. He is going to send these prophets, even though the nation as a whole that he came to save will reject them and kill them just as they had rejected him and killed him. It's because of this that he says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. You see how in all of this, he is a savior who keeps pleading. That's his attitude toward this. Yes, judgment and destruction is going to come. And he's the one that sends that judgment. But he pleads with his people to repent. And you know what? A lot of them do repent. 
There were a lot of people that did repent. There was a whole church that came forth and that, of people that did repent. And so it's not that it didn't do anything. But for most of them, it didn't do anything. And that's what he laments here. So you'll say, but what does this have to do with Halifax today? We're not part of Israel. Well, Jesus, the Son of God, pleads with the whole world to come to him. After he died and rose from the dead to save his people from their sins, he commanded that his salvation should be preached to the ends of the earth. In Mark 16, 15, it is written, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to preach to uh, you know, termites and things like that. But it means that it's, a, it's just a, a hyperbole saying that this gospel needs to go to every single person. What is the gospel? He tells us in the next verse, verse 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Now that was 2,000 years ago, and ever since then he has sent preachers faithfully and others to plead with people to believe in him, to trust in him, to ask him that we might be restored to God. He keeps sending them, doesn't he? He, he keeps doing it. As Paul, who was one of his faithful preachers, once said, Now then, we, we preachers, are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Paul understood it was Jesus Christ who is still pleading in his day after Jesus was gone, and he's still doing that today. Right now, he's pleading with you as you hear this sermon. It is his work. See how his pleading is also very earnest. Surely you can see why. Because the consequences are so extreme, either dire or delightful. As we saw in Mark 16, Jesus says, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe, even if baptized, will be condemned. We're talking about eternity. Either you will be eternally saved, that is, restored to God for everlasting happiness and holiness, and wholeness, I mean, or you will be eternally condemned as one who refused God and remained an enemy of His if you refuse to believe. Think about how long eternity is. We wondered how long the fires would continue. It wasn't very long. Not compared to eternity. Eternity in hell is what we deserve for rejecting God. Even if there would never been any salvation to reject. We deserve hell for rejecting God as, as human beings. We are guilty of this. We're all guilty of this. I am, all of you are. But God has sent His Son to save us, to establish that righteous kingdom that I mentioned before. People have the audacity to say, why doesn't the Lord do something? He did do something. He sent His Son to save us, and He pleads with us to come to Him and be saved. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. Those words pertain to us. We too have rejected God's prophets and refused to come to God by Christ. So what does he do? He has gone beyond pleading. He is so intense with ministering to us that he not only pleads, but he adds calamities to pleading. And that's what I'm showing you here about the earnestness of his plea. It's not enough to just plea. You can plea all day. So he sends things, calamities, to get our attention. He sends calamities to make it clear that things are not right between us and him. In Romans 1.18, we have the general principle given. For the wrath of God, the anger, the displeasure of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress, who push away the truth in unrighteousness. We have pandemics, we have floods, we have hurricanes, we have fires, we have wars, and we have death. These are sent to wake people up to the fact that things are not right between us and God. 
if he had left us to go on in prosperity and simply told us that we needed to be restored, hey, you, you know, you guys are sinners, you need to be restored. And we had perfect prosperity and everything in the world. Nobody would have come. Nobody would listen. Calamities help us. And to make his pleading more potent, he sends them. We all need them. David said, it was good for me that I have been afflicted. In the ancient world, he sent the great flood in Noah's day. Interestingly, before the flood, God really didn't send nearly as much calamity. It was a time of, of real, I mean, people were rich. They were prosperous. They were very healthy. They lived to be usually somewhere between 900 and 1,000 years old. And, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a whole different thing. But they got so corrupt that God sent a, a flood to wash them all off the face of the earth, to cleanse the earth. Noah and his family trusted God's promised salvation, and they alone were delivered from the flood. This was done, why was the flood sent? To smarten up the world. Now you say, oh, well, they were all destroyed. Yeah, they were destroyed, and eternally so. But here's a new family starting out to populate the world again. Now there's a record. There's a huge calamity for this, people. God is serious about this. You've got to deal with this thing that you don't want to deal with in your prosperity. And after the flood, lifespan shortened. There was more trouble. There was more hardship. There, was more, there were more storms. There were more difficulties that, that we see coming in the world. It was a terrible devastation, and it brought, but it brought with it a smartening up. With Israel, we have a picture of how God uses calamity along with his words of uh, pleading, he, the two, how the two go together, because for, we have a history there that we're given a, an inspired record of, of how God dealt with them for, you could say, 2,000 years, going back to Abraham, we have prophetic records of how God dealt with them using pleading together with calamity. And what would happen all the time with Israel? They would go astray. And what would God do? He'd raise up an enemy, and they would kind of overpower them, and then they would cry out to God, and they would go back to Him. That, we, we have this pattern on and on and on with, with God dealing with them using calamity in conjunction. That's how we know how He works, because He's shown us clearly in the Scripture. We read in Amos 4 of the five relatively minor calamities that He sent. I mean, they were hard things, but minor compared to what was going to come later that He sent to them, and He shows the purpose in each one. The first one, I told you, sets the pattern for the rest. Uh, Amos 4, 6, I gave you cleanness of teeth in your cities. Let me say something to children here. That, that's not talking about uh, like having your teeth brushed so that they're really clean. The reason their teeth was, were clean was because they didn't have any food to eat. So their teeth didn't get dirty. That's what he's talking about. He says, I gave you, I gave you cleanness of teeth and lack of bread, you see, in, in all your places. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. This should have woken you up. And so should have all the other calamities, the other four that he sent at that time. Each one we read, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Certainly there were some, there were some as I mentioned before, that did repent. But the nation as a whole did not repent. And so you can, you can say things about a nation, and then you can say things about individuals within the nation. A whole nation can turn to God, and there's always a few people that are still rebellious. Or a whole nation can reject God. And there's always a few people that are still following God. So that's, that's what we're looking at. When Amos wrote, they did not respond to the lesser calamities. So God said, I'm going to send a greater calamity. At last, he sent them into exile in Assyria and Babylon. And more people smartened up through that, that calamity than they did through the minor calamities. That's the way God graciously works. He cares so much about us that he sends affliction so that we will respond. This answers some of the questions that I ask about calamities, doesn't it? Where is the Lord when we have fires like we did this week? Does he know what's going on? Does he do any? Why doesn't he do anything? Does he even care? He absolutely does know. He absolutely does care. And he is absolutely doing something. 
He is the one that sent the calamity. Amos shows that whether natural disasters, enemies being raised up, sickness, or special visitations like what happened at Sodom where fire came down from heaven, God sends calamities with a purpose, one purpose, that we might return to Him. There are harbingers also of the wrath to come, that worse things are going to come. We haven't seen much in the way of calamity compared to what, what it shall be. He does not send these things in a heartless way. He sends them as one who pleads along with them, come to me, be, return to me. Do you have calamities? Do you have calamities in your life? Don't let God be able to say afterward, I sent this to you, and yet you have not returned to me. You didn't respond. You didn't even care. What else are we shown about our Savior here? We see that he is a Savior who is willing and eager to save. I guess that kind of goes without saying from what we've already seen. It's pleading, 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 pleading relentlessly and pleading so strongly that he even sends calamities with the pleading to, to bring about change. But his willingness is highlighted even further in our verse here. He declares that all along he has been willing and eager to save. Look at Matthew 23, 37 again. He adds to the words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together. In all the pleading that he did, he was most sincere. He wasn't pleading and saying, well, I hope you don't come. <laughs> he, he was sincere. He meant it. Come, come, come. Why are you hardening your heart? He wanted to gather the sons of Jerusalem to himself. He says so. Never has a soul come to him looking to be reconciled to God, looking for salvation, and been turned away. That has never happened. He makes this very plain. In John 6, verse 35, he says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. In John 6, 37, he says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. And in John 6, 47, he says, Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. He tells us that there is great rejoicing in heaven over one soul that repents. One soul brings great joy to him as the leader in heaven and all who are with him, the angels. His willingness to receive all who come to him for salvation is born out in history, isn't it? We see it in the Old Testament. One of the wonderful examples is King Manasseh. He was perhaps the most wicked of Israel's kings. We're told that he was the kind of guy that if somebody looked at him, a child looked at him in a way that he thought was disrespectful, he would say, take his head off. He was the kind of guy that was just ruthless. And he, he set up idols all over the place. He, he def, even right into the temple, he brought idolatrous images and things. After a long wicked uh, list of the wicked things that he did, the chronicler says in 2 Chronicles 33, 9, So Manasseh seduced Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to do more evil than the nations whom the Lord had destroyed before the children of Israel. Worse than it was when the Canaanites were there. The Lord pled with him. He pled with Manasseh with both words and affliction. 33.10 And the Lord spoke to Manasseh and his people, but they would not listen. Therefore, the Lord brought upon them, here are the afflictions, the captains of the army of the king of Assyria. This was the exile we were talking about. Who took Manasseh, remember what I told you before, with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. And what did Manasseh do? Marvelously, by God's grace, Manasseh turned to the Lord. He gladly accepted him. Verse 12, 
Now, when he was in affliction, he implored the Lord his God and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed to him. And he himself, great, and, and, I'm sorry, and humbled himself greatly before the God of his fathers and prayed to him. And he received his entreaty. God heard him, heard his supplication and brought him back to Jerusalem into his kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord was God. You see how merciful God is to even this ruthless king. It doesn't matter what you have done, how great your sin might be. He loves to save sinners. When he was here, he was the same way. There was Mary Magdalene from whom he cast out seven demons. She was a woman engrossed in, in a cult and ritual occultism. He saved tax collectors and prostitutes. And he saved hypocrites who had pretended to be righteous and then humbled themselves and came to God. No one was rejected. He even saved those who crucified him with wicked hands. Peter preached to them and called them to repent. And those who repented were welcomed into his kingdom. Paul speaks of how he showed the same mercy to the nations that he ministered to, not just to Israel, but to the nations that were outside, who were guilty of all kinds of sin. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, Paul says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor idol adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. Let me say something about the homosexuals and sodomites. In, uh, among the Greeks, a lot, it, the, way they, the way this went on at that time was most of the men would be married and they would have children by their wife that were their legitimate heirs and children. And then they were promiscuous and they would run around and one of their favorite preferred relationships was with boys that were under 12 years old that they would have relations with. And so when it talks about these He's talking about all kinds of heinous, uh, perverted sins that are going on here. And what does Paul say about these? He says, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites. He goes on, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. But then he says, verse 11, and such were some of you, but you were washed but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. We see the same willingness to receive sinners today. God, it doesn't matter what someone has done. God can save that person. He can deliver. Sometimes we act like that there are sins that are unpardonable. Now, we know that the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is said to be unpardonable, and we could have a whole sermon about that, but the sins that people commit, that, like Paul's talking about here in this list, these, there's, there's no, everyone from blasphemers to child molesters, from religious hypocrites to murderers, whoever comes will be saved. Whoever doesn't come will not be saved. So if you're a self-righteous person going around doing good works, you will not be saved. If you're someone who has murdered multiple people and committed every kind of sin in the book, and you come and repent, then you will be saved. He uses a beautiful illustration of what he does with those who come to him to be saved from their sin. Still in Matthew 23, 37, he says, how often I wanted to gather your children together. We just looked at that. And then he says, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. What an illustration. Farmers will tell us about this, that they will see a, the hen with her chicks and there's some kind of danger and the chicks will go and gather under, and she covers them with her wings. And uh, sometimes they look around, and they don't see, you know, there's no predators around. What's going on? And you look up in the sky. And there's a bird circling around, eyeing those chicks. And the mother is there, ready to protect them and to shield them. Story is told about a hen that, that on, a, on a farm where there were a bunch of children, and the children kind of were enjoying that she'd had her chicks and they were watching them go around thinking about fires this week there was a fire in the barn the family was actually away and they came back and they found their barn was born was burned down 
and went inside to see the destruction. And there was the hen, and she was, she was charred, dead, there in a heap, just a little ball. And the farmer went, he moved the hen over, and the chicks ran out. She stayed in the fire to save the little chicks. And Jesus says, that's a picture of what I do for those that come to me. Is he willing to save you or not? Is he willing to save you? Such is his attitude towards sinners. But what has too often been the response of sinners? Look at the whole verse. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together. I wanted to do this. I wanted to bear your sins. As a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. Nova Scotia is in Amos 4 mode. Our Lord has been sending afflictions to us of a milder sort. And we have not returned to him. We're going to have afflictions of a major sort if we continue. I've had, you know, I've had more occasions to preach calamity sermons over the last three years than I did over the previous 23 years that I've been here. In 1998, there was the crash of Swiss Air Flight 111 near Peggy's Cove. I preached about that that, uh, calamity. It wasn't even a direct calamity to our city in in a certain way. It just happened here. 2001, there was the 9-11 terrorist attack, of course, that, that struck everybody in the free world. And in 2003, there was Hurricane Juan, which especially impacted Halifax. Interestingly, it was right after we overturned our, our holding the Lord's Day as a special day. And people voted to continue it that way, and the, the leaders said no and, and opened up shopping and things for on that day. Maybe, uh, maybe one or two other sermons during those 23 or so years. But in the last three years, I've preached many sermons on calamities that have directly impacted us here in Halifax. From March 2020, I preached multiple sermons related to the coronavirus pandemic as it went on and on. In the middle of all that, we had here in Nova Scotia, the Nova Scotia shooting, April 18 and 19, 2020. I issued a call to repentance in the name of the Lord. And then, just as we were getting through that, Hurricane Fiona hit us hard in September of 2022. And now, here I am today, preaching because the Lord has just struck us with devastating wildfires that destroyed 151 homes in our very city. How have we responded to these calamities? How have we as a people in Nova Scotia responded? You have not returned to me. We have not humbled ourselves because of our sin. We don't even think about it being related to our sin. It just happened. We have not repented. We have not cried out to the Lord for mercy. At best, we get some reference to God like you know, our thoughts and prayers are with you. Some of the leaders that say that now will kind of mutter about, they'll say, oh, our thoughts and prayers are with you. Because they're ashamed to talk about God. But there is none of the what there ought to be. The Lord God Almighty has afflicted us because of our wickedness. And we need to humble ourselves and repent. You say, well, our nation would never do. Well, well, none of them did that. They were a pagan nation that didn't even have, they, they weren't most people who were baptized in the name of the Lord. And they did that at the threat of God. Our leaders will not even acknowledge the Lord at all in these calamities. And if ever they do, they treat him like just a a cushion that you go and cry on. Rather than a sovereign judge who calls us to humble ourselves and come to him for salvation and repent, lest something worse come upon us. Again and again, we have shown that there is no fear of God before our eyes. I will never forget in September 11th, after that ordeal, how Colin Powell, the Secretary of State, quoted from Isaiah 9:10 after the World Trade Towers fell. This was the quote: 
The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. That was exactly the opposite response that, they, that should have been had. This verse that he quoted is about people boasting in their arrogance that God can judge me all he wants and we're going to overcome and make it bigger and better. We're going to replace the sycamore trees with cedar trees. We're going to replace the buildings with, we'll rebuild with hewn stones, the bricks that fell down. This is exactly the opposite. Let me show you that. The verse before, verse 9, Isaiah 9, 9. It says, all the people will know, Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria, who say in pride and arrogance of heart, and then that quote, verse 10, the bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamore trees are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. Repentance is needed, not self-exertion, not self-promotion, not pride. Humility before God. Coming to Jesus as our high priest for mercy and forgiveness is needed. Not pride. Not arrogance. There was an expression of this very same arrogance that was seen with the fires this week. One of the first images that was put up on display when the fires broke out was a fire truck sent out to quell the flames with pride labels plastered all over the side of it. Just shake your fist at God and say, send fire down from heaven because we ain't repenting here. Here you are, should be humble before God and boasting in wickedness. Sodom and Gomorrah, instead of humility, there was pride. Both of these examples illustrate very well what we are like. Richard Sibbs describes us as to a T in his book called The Bruised Reed. He says, men are desirous to have the reputation of good and yet the sweetness of sin. In other words, we enjoy our sin. Sin does have a sweetness, doesn't it? There's a pleasure in sin. So he says, that's, that's what we want. So true of us. We talk about being, oh, so loving and so inclusive, an outward veneer of goodness when we're cherishing evil. This is not goodness. We want to appear good even while holding on to evil, enjoying the sweetness of sin. Sibs goes on to say, nothing is so cordially opposed by them is that truth which lays them open to themselves and to the eyes of others. Oh, and some light shines and exposes the sin and corruption that is there. <sighs> we hate that because we're trying to put on a veneer that we're good and we're so good and we're such good people. And the light comes. That's why the Pharisees hated it so much when Jesus came. Because the light exposed what they really are. And it exposes what you really are. And it exposes that you need a savior. And it exposes that you're, you're being a pig-headed fool if you don't come to him. Oh, Halifax, Halifax, the one who rejects the prophets and casts out those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under his wings. But you were not willing. We go on in that way. Not your will, but my will. Not your way, but my way. That's why some of these things are so, they're, they're so strongly held, like, like with abortion. Why is it so, it's almost like people are, are, are committed to it in a weird way, because I mean, it's a bad thing. It, however you look at it, and, and people are, are committed. Why? Because they're saying, I can do what I want. That's the bottom line. You don't have to be doing abortion to say, I can do what I want, God. I'm not going to do what you want. I'm not going to take what you're giving me. I do what I want. I do it my way. 
Now, I might like God's way okay on a lot of things. It says to be nice to other people. Yeah, that's, that's cool. I'll, I'll be nice to other people. I, I agree with God. But as soon as something comes up that I don't like, then no, my way, not your way. We all have that at the core of us, and we all need to be saved, and the light of God shines on us and exposes us. We need to pray earnestly for the repentance of our city. The mild calamities, that they, they, may, not, may, they may continue for a long time. God is very long-suffering. We don't know. But they will give way to much greater calamities. At last, they will give way to eternal punishment and eternal condemnation in hell with Satan and all of his. But there are those in every generation who do repent. And our gracious Lord always receives them. And when a nation repents, he will receive that nation. He will receive you if you will come to him. Don't go on in your arrogance pretending that you're okay. None of us is okay. We need to turn from our own way to Jesus Christ. He has sent fire. Say, why didn't he do something? He sent fire to our city to humble us. See that you are humbled. Come to him for mercy and forgiveness. And he will rejoice. And he will receive you. Please stand and let's call on his name. Our gracious Heavenly Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of sinners who came here for us, we praise you and thank you, O Lord, for your mercy is great. We see, O Lord, that you take no pleasure in condemning us, that you delight in mercy, that you call us, that you plead with us, that you send affliction to us, that we might repent, that we might be aroused out of our foolish, pig-headed lethargy, We pray, O Lord, have mercy upon us, and we pray that you would do your mighty work. O Father, reach down with your sovereign hand and change these stony, cold hearts, Lord. We pray that you would grant repentance to our people. Father, that we would see your mighty hand moving across our whole region and humbling us and bringing us to to seek your face. Father, we pray that this would begin with us, Lord, because we're people who are going to church, who are here calling on your name. We're, we're putting up at least a pretense of something here. And we pray, Father, that, that you would visit us with your mercy, that we would have sincere hearts that are humble before you, that realize we have nothing but what we have in Christ. Father, take away all the pride that, is, that fills us so and help us to say, not my will, but your will be done, the way the Lord Jesus said. Father, if we're appointed to suffer for you, we pray that we would be willing to suffer for you. If we're appointed to to bear hard things, that we would bear hard things. We are here for you, Lord, and we ask you to help us to remember that we are the creature and you are the creator. We are the servant and you are the master. We are your people and you are our Lord. We praise you that you're a gracious, benevolent Lord and that when we come to you and when we walk with you and when we serve you, that it is the things that make for our peace, that we have tremendous happiness and blessing that comes as a result of that. Even when there is great suffering, there is great joy and there is the knowledge that the suffering will soon end. For you have only appointed that we go through this world in tribulation and then that we go to be with you forever in glory and a new heaven and a new earth where there is righteousness and where you are served with humble, joyful hearts that love as you love, that love each other, that love you, that worship you. Father, how we yearn for that. We're so far from it now. What happiness it will be to have all of those things. Father, to be filled with all the majesty and beauty that is in you, Lord, to to be able to see who you really are and to delight in you, to Father, we we crave after things in this world. We crave after this. We crave after that. And we never really are satisfied. Our hearts are made for eternity. Oh, Father, fill us and prepare us. Give us hope. Give us strength. Give us courage. Oh, Father, we're so feeble. We're so lacking in the things that we need. But you are our Savior, and you're mighty, and you're strong. And you can do what needs to be done. Here we are, Lord. We appeal to you, Lord, have mercy on us. Have mercy on our people. 
Shine your light upon us, Lord, and be gracious to us. For you are our Father, and you have sent Jesus to be our Savior. It is in his name we pray. Amen. God, may the God of all grace, who called us to eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen.